Finding alien life is the dream for so many astrobiologists. And there have been times over the years where people have had that <gasps> moment where they thought they might have discovered life beyond Earth. Specifically in the study of meteorites, so chunks of space rock that fall to Earth. The problem there though is that in the time between a meteorite crash landing here on the surface of Earth and the scientists recovering them, they can get contaminated by Earth bacteria. So, in the past few years, there have been two separate missions that have sent probes to asteroids themselves to collect some pristine, uncontaminated asteroid material and bring it back to Earth for testing. So there was NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission and the Japanese Space Agency's, or JAXA's, Hayabusa 2 mission. And it was in material returned from the Ryugu asteroid by the Hayabusa 2 mission that Genshin collaborators had one of those <gasps> moments when they found something on the surface of the material from the asteroid that looked like bacteria. Now of course this result has been crawling all over the internet in the past few weeks since this study came out, but let's make something clear right now that Genjin collaborators concluded that what they found was actually bacteria from Earth that had contaminated the sample. So in this video, we're gonna dive into the details of this study and talk about how they actually concluded that this was contamination and not the alien life that we'd all been hoping for. Starting first with why we even care about finding life on asteroids. Second, what Genjin collaborators found. Third, why they think it was contamination from Earth bacteria. And finally, what implications this result has. Now it's talk of life beyond Earth that I always find gets kids the most excited about science. And if you wanna nurture that passion for science for a kid in your family, then you've got to try a subscription to KiwiCo, the sponsor of this week's video. KiwiCo clubs provide fun learning for kids of all ages, whether it's about science or sensory play, games or geography. Each club crate is designed by experts and tested by kids to make sure that they provide inspiration, excitement and discovery for all who engage. Even I, a supposedly grown adult, absolutely love the KiwiCo Labs Club. With this delivery bot crate, you can build a rolling radio controlled robot. You never know, like one day your kids could be building this delivery bot from KiwiCo and then the next they're all grown up and designing probes to deliver asteroid samples back to Earth. <laughs> This KiwiCo Labs crate was for ages nine plus, and I know that I would have devoured all of this information at that age when I was just desperate for anything to engage my curiosity. But they also have clubs for younger and bigger kids too. So if there's a kid in your life that you know would absolutely love a subscription to KiwiCo, either as a gift this holiday season or in the new year, and you want to support my channel, click the link in the description below or use the code ASTRODRBECKY to get 50% off your first monthly club crate. So thanks again to KiwiCo for sponsoring during this video. And now let's dive into why we even care about finding life on asteroids. Well, of course, yes, we care about finding life on asteroids because that would be life discovered beyond Earth on another body in the solar system and would show us that we aren't alone. But it would also help solve the mystery of how life even got started on Earth in the first place. Now the most widely accepted theory supported by the most evidence of the moment is called abiogenesis. I.e. life developed naturally from just having all of the ingredients needed there. So your molecules like with carbon and amino acids, these non-living compounds that were the ingredients needed for life. And you might wonder, well, where did those ingredients come from then? And yes, okay, they could have, again, developed naturally here on Earth thanks to Earth's chemistry. But they also could have been brought to Earth by asteroids and comets impacting with the very early Earth in an era of the solar system's evolution where there were many smaller chunks of rock flying around, leading to many more impacts than we see today. It's how we think Earth got a lot of its water as well because comets and asteroids have a lot of ice on them. But there's also another hypothesis that explains how life on Earth might have got started and also why it appeared so rapidly, and that is panspermia, where life itself was brought to Earth on asteroids. So not the ingredients needed for life, but actually life 
already existing on the asteroid itself. Now this is not a new idea, it's been around in some loose form or another for millennia, but serious scientific discussion around panspermia started in the middle of the 19th century, as people started to consider Charles Darwin's origin of species, which introduced this idea of evolution through a tree of life back to some common ancestor but origin of species and the theory of evolution never touched on what that common ancestor was. It was left to other biologists and chemists to figure that out and also come up with the idea of abiogenesis. Meanwhile, the astronomers and astrologists just ended up complicating things as they started considering this idea of panspermia in the 20th century. Now again, panspermia does not touch on this idea of a common ancestor, it doesn't touch on how life actually got started, all it really considers is how life is distributed through the universe. Now the problem with panspermia is that a lot of its predictions we can't actually test because we're either stuck here on Earth or stuck just sending probes into the solar system. We can't go beyond that to test whether it is actually distributed through the Milky Way or through the universe. So one of the only predictions of panspermia that we could actually test is whether there is life on asteroids or on meteorites as we call them once they've uh, impacted with the surface of the earth. Now people have claimed to have found evidence of life in meteorites that have crashed to earth in the past. The problem is that anything that's been in contact with the earth's surface is very likely to rapidly become contaminated with earth bacteria. So most studies do end up concluding that what they found is contamination from Earth, unsurprisingly. But there are others that have claimed to have found extraterrestrial life in meteorite samples. But even so, there will always be doubt in the scientific community about those works that conclude that what they found is extraterrestrial life in meteorites because you can't even be 90% sure, never mind 99% or 100% sure that what you found is not contamination of life from Earth's surface. Which is why we've seen two missions to asteroids to collect samples and return them to Earth in the past decade. There was NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission, which journeyed to the asteroid Bennu, it bounced off the surface and collected the debris thrown up in the impact. It then successfully returned its sample to Earth in a sealed container in September 2023, and the analysis is ongoing. Then there was also JAXA's Hayabusa 2 mission, which journeyed to the asteroid Ryugu to collect its sample. It successfully returned the sample to Earth again in a sealed container in December 2020. The full sample was opened by JAXA in a clean chamber, so one with a very low pressure, like almost a vacuum, before then being stored in nitrogen, and then a tiny one millimetre square sample of the full sample was then transported to the UK, where it was first studied by researchers at the Natural History Museum in London, and now Genjin collaborators. Which brings me to part two, what they actually found. So here are some images taken with a scanning electron microscope that allows them to see tiny scales on the surface of this already very small particle. So you can see the scale in the corner there, 50 micrometers. That's 50 millionths of a meter or 0.00005 meters. It is tiny. For context, a human hair ranges anywhere from about 17 to about 180 micrometers, depending on the thickness of your hair. So a human hair would completely swamp the images shown here, which as you can see, even step down to smaller scales of just a micrometer. And what Genjin collaborators spotted in these images is these tube-like shapes that they refer to as rods and filaments. You can see in figure 1c one of those rods and filaments up close, right? It even has these obvious divots in the side that actually suggested individual cells that have divided and are connected together. So the question is, what are these things that they've seen? Well, the first thing Genjin collaborators did was check they weren't just like common fibres that you see just in and around the lab. So things like, you know, human hair, cotton fibers, or fibers from like pads or wipes they were using in the lab. You know, if you just sort of like rub on your clothes or like pop them, you'll see tiny little fibers just escaping. So first things first, you check you haven't seen your own hair or jumper on your precious sample of asteroid. And if you compare these two images side by side, you can see that none of the fibers they collected from the lab could explain what they'd seen 
on the surface of the asteroid sample. Instead, they do think it's a form of bacteria, a form of life, because the number of these rods and filaments that they saw on the surface of the asteroid changed over time. So the first time they looked at the surface with the electron microscope was seven days after they first opened the container on November 11th, 2022, and they found 11 rods and filaments. By November 30th, 147 of these rods and filaments were observed, and then by January 14th, 2023, there were only 36 of them. So it's an evolving population. It's clearly life that they found, but don't get too excited, because now we get to part three. How Genjin collaborators figured out that this was just contamination from Earth bacteria. Now, first of all, bacteria evolve or multiply in a very predictable fashion. First, there's the lag phase where bacteria are starting to adapt to a new environment. Then there's the log growth phase where they start to multiply exponentially, doubling their numbers in a set period of time, depending on what like bacteria species you have. They can't keep multiplying indefinitely though, at some point they'll hit what's known as the stationary phase, where they've hit the limit on like a natural resource that's required to help support the colony. And then you get to the death phase that happens like an exponential decay, which is what Genjin collaborators observed with their initial 11 rods and filaments, going up to 147 rods and filaments a few weeks later, and then a few weeks after that, back down to 36. And if you model that growth, you get that the bacteria double every 5.1 days, meaning that that contamination most likely happened when the sample was first polished back at the start of November 2022. Now, Genjin collaborators also gave their best guess at what type of bacteria they'd observed here. Going with bacillus, one of the most common bacteria found in soil and in water, but also in human intestinal systems as well. It is rod shaped and it can form a tough outer protective layer, allowing it to tolerate extreme environmental conditions like what you find in clean chambers because of the low pressures. What's more is that yes, under normal conditions, bacillus has a doubling time on that log phase growth of 120 minutes. When it's actually in a very low pressure stressed environment, the doubling time for bacillus is more like 6.6 days, much closer to the 5.1 days that Genjin collaborators found for their rods and filaments they saw on the surface of this sample. And you might be thinking, well, okay, but what if there was life present in this asteroid sample? And then once it's been exposed to the sort of nice toasty ambient temperature conditions of a lab, it's then sprung into action. Well, that is a possibility, but you've got to remember that before Genjin collaborators got their hands on it, this sample spent 280 days at that nice toasty ambient temperature. If it was present from the start, there would have been way more than just 11 rods and filaments by the time that Genj and collaborators took a look at it. Plus, after the decline of the number of rods and filaments that they saw in January, they repolished the surface of this sample, kept an eye on it for another four months, but saw no more rods and filaments in that time. If this was bacteria that was pervading, you know, the entire asteroid sample, because it, you know, it was life from the asteroid itself, it would have repopulated the surface. So, you might be a little bit sad at this result, which brings me to part four. What implications this result has? Because you might think, well, if it's just contamination, then this result doesn't really tell us anything. But it does. It tells us two things. The first is objectively less exciting, but the second is very exciting. So first, it tells us that our contamination protocols to try and prevent this aren't good enough. The contamination happened in such a short period of time and the bacteria quickly colonized the surface. And yes, okay, that's annoying if you're looking for life, but also that can cause chemical changes to the surface of the asteroid sample that you're looking at. So for example, it could remove minerals that the bacteria are feeding on, or, you know, bacteria could poop out new minerals that weren't there in the first place. And that's a big deal if you're trying to work out what asteroids are made of, as they are these relics of the solar system, these fossils from when the solar system was formed. So this is a big deal, and Genjin collaborators suggest a review on the current protocols to make sure more samples from Hayabusa or Osiris-Rex aren't contaminated. And the second, objectively more exciting thing that it tells us is that Earth life can not necessarily thrive, but exist on extraterrestrial material. As we saw, the bacteria rapidly colonized that sample of foreign rock under what was already very stressful conditions 
for bacteria. And that's really exciting if we think about maybe moving off planet one day like all the sci-fi stories consider. And maybe in that scenario we might need to colonise a new planet with Earth life. We now have evidence that Earth life can actually do that and sustain a population of bacteria, you know, on the surface of something that is innately foreign to that Earth life. And of course, this also brings back to our decontamination protocols for other missions when we send things to other bodies in the solar system. Like for example, if we're gonna send a rover to Mars or a probe to one of the moons of Jupiter where it could be possible for life to thrive. We are gonna have to double and triple check those missions for contaminants because it turns out Ian Malcolm was right when he most famously said, "Life." Uh, finds a way. Clear, straight up now. Straight up now, that doesn't even make any sense. The full sample was open. Oh God, I just heard a massive noise from downstairs that I think was the cat, hang on. This one was playing with Christmas packages by the front door, just what it was. I was very worried she'd knocked the Christmas tree over, but <laughs> thankfully not. <laughs> and do that again, because the cat's from the back of the sofa. What she's like, she's like, all the back. Sorry, my earrings. I have got tiny little jingle bells on them. So if you've been hearing a very Christmassy jingle bell all the way through this, because I'm just wobbling my head, that, that's that's why. I'm sorry if that's annoying, but it's also joyful. So suck it. There. 